A few years ago, a book called The Life of Muhammad, founder of the religion of Islam and the empire of the Saracens, was republished. It had been written in the 1800s by the Reverend George Bush, who was distantly related to two American presidents of the same name. When it came out again, it caused a lot of controversy and uproar, and many Muslims were outraged. I happened to be in the United States at the time, and a lot of people couldn't understand why Muslims were so outraged by the book. Wasn't Muhammad the founder of Islam? Well, this gave me a good opportunity to clarify this matter with them. A matter that is perhaps less complex than it might at first appear. Because after all, Islam is characterized by being a very simple and straightforward religion. You don't need to be a philosopher in order to understand it. Muslims believe that there is only one God. They also believe that there is only one human race. This is because men are not superior to women, whites are not superior to blacks, Arabs are not superior to Indians. So there is only one God and only one human race. In other words, there is only one sender and only one receiver. The sender is God Almighty, the creator of the universe, and the receiver is the human race. So why would any rational person think that the sender God sent to the receiver, the human race, contradictory messages. That would be completely unfair and confusing. It was always one message, one religion sent by God to the human race through different messengers. So whose religion is that? Is it the religion of Muhammad or is it the religion of Jesus or is it the religion of Moses or is it the religion of Abraham or who? It is the religion of God Almighty who communicated this religion to mankind through Prophet Muhammad and 600 years before him through Jesus son of Mary and few years before that through John the Baptist as well as through prophets Solomon, David, Moses, Abraham and Noah. So there is no God except one. There is one human race and there is one religion but many messengers and many books of the same religion. That is why saying that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was the founder of Islam is a grave mistake because he was simply the last messenger and prophet to be sent with the message of Islam. And that is exactly what the Quran says. It says, Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. In other words, Muhammad is just a messenger, one of the messengers the last of the messengers. The same thing is said about Jesus in the Quran. It says, Christ the son of Mary was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. So all of these were messengers that God sent to mankind with the same religion contained in a different book. Muhammad is a colleague of Jesus and Moses and Abraham, a graduate of the same school from which they graduated, the school of God. Next, we come to a related misconception, which is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the one who wrote the Quran. In order to clear this misconception, we must understand that there are logically three possibilities related to the Quran. The first of these is that the Quran was written by a human, whether this human is Prophet Muhammad or someone else. The second possibility is that the Quran was indeed revealed to Muhammad by the devil and not by God. The third possibility is that it was in fact revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, by God Almighty. Let us solve this problem by the process of elimination. If two of them are proven wrong, then logically the third possibility is the right answer. Now, let us see if it's possible that the Quran is the word of the devil revealed to the Prophet. Logically, this seems quite impossible. If the devil had indeed written or sent that book, he definitely wouldn't vilify himself in almost every single page. He wouldn't damn himself and scorn himself. He wouldn't warn against himself. He wouldn't say, do not follow the footsteps of the devil. And more significantly, he wouldn't command us to do good deeds. He wouldn't forbid indecency. He wouldn't forbid all evil deeds, such as oppression, lying, and killing. So there is really no way this could be the word of the devil. Therefore, we are left with the possibilities that it is either the word of God or that it was written by a human being. Let us examine the possibility of its being written by a human being. In that case, it must either have been written by the Prophet himself or by someone else. Let us first see if it could have been written by the Prophet, peace be upon him himself. That is not possible because of three reasons. First of all, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was an Arab who was sent with an Arabic book and was sent first to the Arab people. Now, the Jews had been long time enemies of the Arabs. 
Before the appearance of the Prophet peace be upon him, the Jews used to tell the Arabs that the era of the final Prophet was due and that they would then massacre the Arabs. They assumed that the awaited Prophet would be from among themselves, just like most of the previous Prophets were indeed from among the Israelites. So why would Muhammad provoke the Arabs by naming one whole chapter of the Quran after an Israelite, a Jewess, Mary, mother of Jesus. Why didn't he name it after an Arab woman? For example, after Khadija, his beloved wife, or Fatima, his beloved daughter, or Amina, his mother. Can anyone recite for me a couple of verses from a Surah Khadija, or from the chapter of the Quran called Fatima, or from another chapter called Aisha, or Amina? Of course not, because there are no such chapters or surahs in the Quran. Well, why not? These were all women who had a very important influence in his life and whom he deeply loved. So why didn't he name any chapter after any of them? Would it make sense for him to name one after Mary, but not name anyone after his wife Khadija or daughter Fatima or his mother Amina? Well, it simply wasn't for him to decide. It wasn't his own handy work. Now we come to the second reason. Supposing I happen to find a book without a cover. If I read a bit of it, I can probably tell you who the author is if I have already read other works by the same author. I can tell you that from the style of the writing, this must be Charles Dickens, for example, or Shakespeare. So the obvious question would be, did the Prophet, peace be upon him, say anything else besides the Quran? Of course he did. And that is the Sunnah, which include a compilation of his sayings. Anyone who has knowledge of Arabic, who reads the Quran and reads the sayings of the Prophet can clearly tell that the person who wrote or said this is definitely not the same person who wrote or said that. The Quran and the Sunnah are of completely two different styles. The third argument is that the Quran has certain instructive verses in which God Almighty disciplines the Prophet peace be upon him. Note that the Prophet's parents and grandfather all died when he was very young. So who provided guidance and instruction to him? It was God Almighty who did that. We find a chapter called Abasa, which means he frowned. The story behind that chapter is that the Prophet peace be upon him was sitting in a very important meeting with the leaders of the tribe of Quraysh who were the idolaters of the city of Mecca. It was a very important meeting because if he could convince them to embrace Islam, that would have been marvelous. There would have been no future battles between the Muslims and the tribe of Quraysh and it would have been a totally wonderful outcome. A blind companion of the Prophet came up to him at that time upon hearing his voice, not knowing that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was in the middle of an important meeting. So he came up to the Prophet and asked him to advise him. When the Prophet saw him coming, he felt it wasn't the right time for that, so he frowned and turned away and continued his conversation with the others. If you contemplate this story, you notice that the Muslim man being blind did not even realize that the Prophet peace be upon him had frowned or that he had turned his face away from him. He only knew of that when the incident was mentioned in the Quran. God immediately disciplined the Prophet by revealing the very intense verses of the Quran saying, he frowned and turned away because there came to him the blind man. But what could tell you that perchance he might grow in spiritual understanding or that he might receive admonition and the teaching might profit him? As to one who regards himself self-sufficient, to him you do attend? These are very intense words that discipline the Prophet peace be upon him for frowning and turning his face away. None of the companions of the Prophet, nor the blind man himself, would have otherwise known that he had frowned and turned away. A later part of the chapter says, by no means should it be so, for it is indeed a message of instruction. So in other words, there is a strong admonition to the Prophet telling him that this is a reminder so that he should never do that again. There are also many other verses which instruct and guide the Prophet peace be upon him. One of them is related to the incident that happened when some of the idolaters went to the Jews and told them, you are people of the book, so you have more knowledge than us. Tell us some difficult questions that we can corner him with so that his companions can know that he is a fraud or a liar. 
So they gave them three questions to ask. The idolaters took the three questions to the Prophet, peace be upon him, but because he never spoke from his own desires, but rather conveyed to people the revelation sent to him from God, he told them that he would have to answer them next day as the revelation had not come to him yet. At that time, however, the Prophet forgot something very important. He forgot to say, Insha'Allah, meaning God willing. That's all. So what happened? For 15 days, no answer was revealed to him from God. And the idolaters kept coming back to him and he had to keep telling them that he still had no answers. Of course, it was a very embarrassing situation for him. Finally, after the 15 day period of divine discipline aimed at the prophet, the chapter called the cave finally descended upon him. It contained the answers to the questions and contained as well a verse that said, and do not say of anything, I shall be sure to do so and so tomorrow, without adding, should Allah will it. So this verse served to admonish and guide him, as well as to guide us too, to acknowledge and remember that everything happens according to God's will. And there are many examples from the Quran where God is disciplining the Prophet in a way that makes it very difficult to believe that he wrote that about himself. What's very interesting as well is that the name Jesus is mentioned in the Quran 25 times, Abraham 63 times, Moses 131 times, while Muhammad was mentioned by name just five times. It is very difficult to imagine that he authored a book and mentioned other prophets that much and did not mention his name except five times. Add to this that the Prophet Muhammad was illiterate. He never had any type of formal education, never read any book. Is it possible for a man like that to write a book that tackles beliefs, doctrine, wisdom and law? A book that became the number one source of knowledge and legislation for billions of people? Is it possible for an illiterate to accomplish all that? Being illiterate is definitely viewed as negative, except in the case of the Prophet Muhammad. His illiteracy proved his legitimacy. So to conclude this part, we can say that the issue of the Quran being written by the Prophet has been researched extensively and there is no way it could have been written by him. Next, we come to the possibility of it being written by another human being. There are many arguments that can be put forward to disprove this. We must remember that the Quran was revealed at the time when the Arabs were the masters of rhetoric the masters of poetry. They were extremely well versed in the Arabic language and could turn out magnificent pieces of prose and poetry. God Almighty challenged those masters of the Arabic language when he said in the Quran, if all mankind were together together to produce the like of this Quran, they could not produce the like thereof, even if they backed each other with help and support. Of course, this was a very big challenge. The masters of the Arabic language and the great poets failed to come up with anything similar to the Quran in its eloquence and charm. So God made them a sort of discount and gave them an easier challenge. He challenged them to come up with only 10 chapters. He said in the Quran, or they may say, he forged it. Say, bring you 10 chapters forged like unto it and call to your aid whomsoever you can. In other words, God told them to get whatever help and support they needed and to come up with only 10 chapters. But they still failed to meet the challenge. So they got yet another discount. God Almighty said in the Quran, and if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed from time to time to our servant, then produce a chapter like thereunto, and call your witnesses and helpers if there are any besides Allah. So God challenged them to come up with one single chapter as beautiful as the chapters of the Quran. It was a very big challenge that the masters of the Arabic language at that time still couldn't meet. The eloquence and linguistic beauty of the Quran is absolutely inimitable and is considered one of the miracles of the Quran. This is a concept that is extremely difficult to convey to a non-Arab speaker. The fact that the language of the Quran is far beyond mere Arabic. Rather, it is a form of Arabic far more poetic, complex, and meaningful than any Arabic text that came before or after the Quran. There is also another miraculous aspect to the Quran. It concerns the scientific facts contained within it. God says in the Quran, Soon we will show them our signs in the distant regions of the earth and in themselves until it becomes manifest to them that this is the truth. In other words, there are miraculous signs that God will show us in relation to ourselves and to the entire universe. 
Note that until some scientific discoveries of the 19th and 20th centuries, there were verses of the Quran that were not fully understood because they referred to scientific facts unknown to the world at that time. For example, there is a verse that says, whoever Allah guides, he opens his heart for Islam and whoever he allows to go astray, he makes his chest constrained as if he is ascending gradually in the sky. This verse states as fact that gradual ascent in the sky leads to gradual difficulty in breathing. Who at that time knew that at high altitudes, the lower air pressure makes it more difficult for oxygen to enter our vascular systems? Did the Prophet or any of his companions happen to be astronauts? Nobody in the world knew that at that time except the Almighty, the Creator. Another example is the verse that says, have we not made the earth as a wide expanse and the mountains as pegs? God compared the mountains to pegs used to anchor a tent. If you look at the pegs of a tent, you will find that they do not bear any resemblance to a mountain. But when we use them, we hammer them almost completely into the ground, leaving only the tip exposed to which we tie the rope of the tent. And this is exactly what scientists found out about mountains. The part that we see above the ground is nothing but the very tip of the structure of the mountain. Most of the mountain is below ground, exactly like pegs, and the tip is the only part we see above ground. Mount Everest, for example, measures 64 kilometers below ground and only 8 kilometers above ground. That is exactly what Dr. George Airy, the British geologist, found out. He said, the mountains we see are merely the tops of great masses of rock floating in a denser substratum like icebergs float in water. And there are numerous other examples pertaining to biology, embryology, physiology, oceanology, and many other branches of science. So to recap, we were able to prove that the Quran is not the word of the devil and that it was not authored by a human, whether the Prophet peace be upon him or any other person. We are thus left with one possibility, that it is the word of God Almighty, who sent it to mankind through Muhammad, who did not speak according to his own whim, but who received revelation from Allah.